So speaking of uh, airline uh, leasing companies, have you ever heard of AirCap? <laughs> AirCap is my largest long. Oh, it <laughs> I is. I love AirCap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've yeah, I've been a long time bull on AirCap. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a very high quality company. They <laughs> look, they haven't lost money. As a public company, they've never lost money. They didn't lose money in 08, 09. The stock got obliterated because of financing conditions, obviously. But I mean, that's uh, that's the interesting thing about AirCap, right? It, it trades as if it is, I don't want to say as if it's an airline, but it trades with the stink of an airline. It when trades like it's fact, distressed, yeah. Exactly. When in actual fact, I mean, I guess the right way to think about it is most people will comp it to other asset utilization businesses, right? To other leasing businesses like equipment leasing or whatever or ship leasing. Sure. But the thing they don't understand is that airlines is essentially an oligopoly. It's a two-player market for passenger fixed-wing passenger aircraft. There is only two players. So supply and demand for fixed-wing passenger aircraft has been far better managed than any of these other equipment leasing businesses or ship leasing businesses for a generation because it's in the OEM's best interest, right? It's not in Boeing or Airbus's interest to flood the world with planes and watch the value of those planes decline. You know, because they have a 10-year black backlog they're trying to sell at increasing rates, you know, that at least keep up with inflation. So that provides the people who then buy that equipment at an initial discount, which obviously AirCap does, uh, and then lease it out on long-term fixed contracts. That provides them with a huge amount of security because, in a, in a sense, they're on the same side as the OEMs, right? Whereas they're not really on the same side. If you, if you buy ships, right, from a shipyard, and then you and then you lease those out, and the shipping rates go way up. You're not on the same side as the shipyard. The shipyard wants to pump out more ships, um, so it's it's actually quite a unique kind of uh, a financing business, um, and one that look, it hasn't really gotten credit for a very long time, but I don't think you need that to make money even from here. It's had a it's had a pretty decent year, but you know, th- these these names are dropping like flies, right? The private market is picking up uh, businesses of these these kinds of businesses uh, left, right, and center. And so, look, I, I fully expect AirCap to be taken out at some point by a large financial institution with a structurally low cost of capital, much like um, much like Aircastle got taken out by a Japanese uh, bank and trading house consortium. It would not surprise me to see AirCap taken out in three or four years by some you know, Japanese insurance company or Japanese bank consortium. Um, having once, once, uh, once Angus, the CEO, Angus Kelly, once he's achieved his midterm growth targets, when he's happy to sell the business, I'm pretty sure he he gets it, uh, and that's probably where the business is going to go. Where do you, and how do you compare AirCap to the other business you uh, just brought up before? You mean how do I how do I how do I look at it as a as a long on my on my metrics? Yeah, because you, you said a lot of nice things about that other company. I, I forget what what the name was now. Uh, sh- yeah, was it Shinikin or was it oh, oh Air Lease? Yeah, Airlease yeah, yeah, is the yeah, other one. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I use Airlease because that's a pretty clean example to to demonstrate the um, the tax, the cash tax versus stat tax anomaly, because they are you know U.S. listed, U.S. GAAP reporter, um, but but obviously the, the planes are are domiciled offshore. Um, actually, Aircap's reported tax rates are much closer to their to the actual cash tax because they are you know Netherlands domiciled and Ireland based. So there isn't as much of a discrepancy there that I need to adjust for. Look, those two companies are not too dissimilar. Um, they both kind of have their roots in the beginnings of the aircraft leasing business. Um, the main difference is AirCap is completely agnostic to growth. So going back to what I said, I really don't care about growth. In fact, I prioritize no growth if I'm getting the capital back. So that's exactly because they how buy the back a lot of stock, Angus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they they've made it extremely clear over and over and over again they do not care to grow the fleet. In fact, the fleet, in absolute terms, has not grown in three and a half years. Didn't they because, buy back like yeah. it was like thirty, forty percent of their their shares outstanding yeah. a few years ago? Yeah, in the last exactly in the last five years, they've retired thirty eight, thirty nine percent of shares yeah. at the time um, through buybacks, which puts I, them in the. Top I'll tell you, I, I, I've listened to a lot of their conference calls. He, the C, is a really, really sharp guy. Yeah, Angus. Angus is you know true outsider CEO. Um, if he left, it would be devastating. Um, a brilliant CEO, and yeah, they've they've been very clear about their capital allocation priorities. So so they can sell you know a 10, 11 year old fixed wing plane at you know eight percent above their carrying value for the plane, but obviously they finance it right. So and then they buy the back and then they buy back below book value, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So there's a huge ARB, right? So as long as that exists, they'll continue to do it, even if it means they don't grow. They're happy to sell their planes down. And look, they sell, call it one to two billion net book value of planes every year. They have a 35 billion asset uh, fleet. Um, so call it five to seven percent of the book turns over every year. And with that five to seven percent, they retire, you know, eight, nine percent of the stock um, essentially is the way to do it. So every year owning eight percent more of the company, maybe nine percent, depending on the year. Um, and uh, and actually also at the same time, the balance sheet is getting improved because they've repositioned the fleet from being quite an old fleet, which it was when they acquired ILFC's business in uh, 2014. Um, to a much younger business with a much uh, better credit profile. In other words, they've locked in the leases from their customers for 7.2 years on average, whereas five years ago it was, uh, I think it was under five years. It was it was a much shorter period of time. 